All right, I could find the speaker as well here, Ral Aris and also Captain. Yes, hi Ral. Welcome Hello, to the everybody. Future Skills Maritime. A big, big welcome to you and thank you for coming and joining us for this one hour session. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, Ral, and we are all looking forward to hosting you. And thank you, Ocean Technologies, for taking up this prime time slot in uh, our day one of uh, the Future Skills Maritime. We've had a lovely day so far. Lots of good viewership over our Facebook Live and YouTube Live channels. And uh, I would just like to introduce Ral uh, to uh, the global audience. Uh, Ral actually needs no introductions. He's been heading VideoTel. And, uh, but a little official introduction to all those people in India who are looking forward to hearing you. Here comes. So can we have Ral's introduction played, please, now? Ral Harris, Group Creative Director, Ocean Technologies UK. Ral is a Group Creative Director at Ocean Technologies Group, the home of Coex, Marlins, MTS, Seagull, Terramarine, and Videotel brands. He advises on the creative development process and leads the brand marketing and communication activities of the learning and technology solutions that the group offers. Prior to becoming part of the group, Ral was managing director of Videotel, where he gained extensive experience in the production of maritime training content and software solutions for over 15 years. An active participant in the maritime industry, RAL is involved with numerous seafarer welfare organizations, ship management associations, and international shipping entities. RAL's diverse background includes university lectureships in interaction design, information product design, and computer games design, which gives him invaluable experience in structuring and designing, engaging learning material, evaluating learner performance, and creating rewarding user experiences. RAL is to technology what a polar bear is to ice, inseparable. The Naval Connection proudly presents RAL Harris as speaker at the FSM 2020. Yes. Yes, RAL. What a, what a fine introduction. So, I'm blessed. <laughs> Thank you very much again. So now I hand over to you and uh, you can please make your presentation. And after that, we'll come back for a short chat and a, a question answer sessions. Over to you, Raj. Sure. Thank you very much, Captain. And, and good day to everybody. It's, uh, it's really uh, fantastic to, to get a chance to, to, to be with you, especially as this, uh, I know there's a very big, although it's a global event, there's a very big Indian uh, representation here and normally I, I'm this time of year I'm, I'm normally in uh, in India or, or, or shortly there but sadly of course with everything going on I, I haven't been able to uh, to be here this year so um, yeah the, the introduction there sort of uh, took care of this slide really um, many of you that do know me uh, there will probably know me from my video tell years but we formed the ocean technologies group uh, in March of this year, and uh, that was the coming together of those brands, both in technology and uh, and on the learning side that, that many of you are familiar with and no doubt use, because we have uh, substantial reach into the market and consequently are able to draw on a lot of data and a lot of anecdotal experience of working and helping our customers to achieve their objectives. So, um, so I hope that uh, so I can provide some some insights for you today. Uh, around that, and although these brands are sort of historic, and we're very proud of our, our long standing in in the industry, um, it is a time of disruption, as we've been hearing about in the sessions this morning. And um, and of course, uh, that disruption, that digital disruption, has really accelerated uh, under under through through COVID uh, in some ways for the good. Um, but uh, but it does pose challenges. But um, and so one of the reasons why that last a uh, bright blue block there, a startup with 60 years experience is kind of like a strange uh, conundrum, I suppose, but it, but it really does uh, inform how we're approaching things now as we've come together as a group. We've looked at it and we think the disruption in, in the industry requires us to look with fresh eyes at our business 
and look at, at how we need to uh, to sort of face front for uh, to meet all those challenges, which I'll talk a little bit more about how we're, we're doing that today. Those learning brands really, in case you're unaware, are operating across two main areas of assessment and learning. And those two things obviously work hand in hand, but um, but there are clear differences in, in, in what you're trying to do with those two. So so we've got you know all kinds of assessments, things like the, the, the English language testing, which Marlin's bringing into this, but also behavioral testing uh, and uh, psychometric testing, that kind of thing, as well as the traditional uh, STCW type uh, testing. And then, of course, through learning, and it, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the directions we're going in, but a, a real kind of diverse picture there, a mixture between things like competency management, certified courses, and then sort of e-learning and even bespoke content these days. Um, and then all of that needing to be managed and all of that data picture to be kept on top of. And uh, and, and and that, again, is something that I'll, I'll reflect on today. Um, but yeah, there's not many areas of, of, of tra training that we're not involved in, have some touch point with. Um, so let's take a little look at the, uh, I mentioned about the disruption and, and what we're really talking about there. And I think um, I won't dwell on a lot of these points because they're points that were made and very well in, in previous sessions. And uh, it's really a theme, I suppose, of this, uh, this conference. But for me, they, I'm seeing this from sort of technological factors point of view and human factors. And um, of course, the, the, you know, the technology side of things has, has really accelerated in the last six months, but already we had new types of fuel, we had new vessels coming on, um, the internet of things kind of adoption, uh, pressures from cybersecurity, automation coming in, and all of these things, of course, have an impact on the human factors and, and the operation of those and the implementation of those technology factors. And ECDIS is a really good example of where we saw that. So it's something with a, a technology focus coming in to replace the paper charts and we saw what a challenge that was for our industry um, to be able to uh, to be able to translate that it's not simply a, a one for wire like for like thing um, so and then really just what what's kind of bringing those two things together or uh, is the in, in increased legislation and best practice guidelines and this is a point that I think is really worth reflecting on because um, when we had a uh, when we had a, a, a situation that, that was, was moving at a much more even pace, legislation could keep up and it was easy to, well, not easy, it's never been easy, but we were able to create international, agree international uh, legislation together and move at that pace. But what we see is technology changing things too quick for us to be able to go through those processes. And so consequently, I'm seeing much more uh, coming through from sort of best practice guidelines where industry groups, so like, um, so Ockham for or an Intertanko may produce some guidelines and then that guidelines published and people need to react much more quickly. So so we have a, um, a, a number of pressures coming in there. And what we're seeing is that that is going to ultimately determine the kind of seafarers that we need that can operate in that environment and, and, people, and for us to get the most out of those seafarers. So let's look at, at, at what we're really asking for from, from the seafarer of, of tomorrow. And when I say tomorrow, I mean the very near future. What are we going to need from, from them? It's quite a list. So all the old skills, all of the seamanship, that goes uh, for granted, the communication, the ability to, to, to speak uh, good English and understand and everything. All of those things are just, uh, that's, you know, 101. We also now see we need to keep uh, to, to be able to get them to be resilient. I mean, that's become nothing has been more clear than the amazing work that they've done our seafarers for us this year in, in keeping uh, keeping everything uh, turning with the incredible pressures there. But already this was something that we were talking about um, last year. We need them to be great leaders and managers, particularly if they're officers. We expect those skills and we need those skills. Uh, this is one that I sort of see uh, when a lot of the work that we've done within the mental health and well-being area, you know, there's there's quite a lot of um, pressure, I suppose, or we are looking for the people on board to be able to also help out on this front. And these are not, not easy skills, you know, they don't come naturally, but people are in these high pressure situations on board the ship. And we are looking to some of those people to step up and to fulfill these kind of roles. 
IT whiz, they've got to be, you know, this technology is coming thick and fast and we have, uh, we have to have an appreciation of that. So that whole digital literary, literacy piece and being able to um, be able to kind of uh, get on top of these things as they emerge um, tells us something else as well, that we, we not only need them to be IT savvy and digitally literate, but we also need them to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. So when they do come across something that they don't know, they can break that problem down and work out sort of how they're going to solve that problem. And on top of that, and these things kind of going hand in hand, we're going to need them to be an autodidact, by which I mean they're going to need to be able to teach themselves or through self-directed learning to be able to find the answers to the problems that we need. Now, that's quite a list uh, and quite a lot of expectation that we're putting on. But also, these are the skills, the core kind of skills that people are looking for everywhere. And so we're seeing that uh, a lot of these uh, other industries are looking for these people as well. And so shipping industry needs to look at this and decide how are we going to meet that challenge? Are we going to buy? Are, are we going to, to pay the, these people and, and, and get the very best uh, that already come ready wrapped with these skills? Or are we going to look to build them? And I think that this is this is really what we would expect from our industry that we would build. We have cadet programs, excellent ones, many of which are in India, and and we have these these um, abilities to. We're very good at doing that, and I think this is something that will continue. Now, to do that, we're going to need some things right off the bat, and obviously. A learning management system and LMS is kind of core to that to be able to manage all those activities and bring them together. They could be kind of things like Seagull or Videotel have, have done for many years. Those kind of uh, onboard systems really are a, a, an LMS and also shoreside ones as well. And linking up those two things is increasingly something that part of the conversations that we're having, particularly with our bigger customers, is how we actually start to look at those things as one. And uh, that's been one of the things that I've really enjoyed over the last uh, couple of years is, is, is because traditionally we were working in a very sort of just on, on board the ship. And the more conversations we have, the more we can see this whole joined up picture and start to really make a difference to help organizations to, to, to meet their objectives. Now, increasingly as well, um, in doing that, we're bringing together the classroom with e-learning plus real world tasks that people are doing and then, of course, simulators and all those sorts of things around it. And, and seeing all those things as one, as one thing, each should be backing up the other, extending the learning and so forth. And then I started with LMS, but really LMS doesn't really sort of describe what, we're, what we need right now. And, and that's why we have called our new system, the Ocean Learning Platform, because really it needs to be uh, a, a, a learning kind of um, a learning system that that is operating in lots of different places across different devices and across different apps which all come together to give us the overall thing so we're talking about an omni-channel you know lots of different ways that we're we're co connecting with the seafarer that we're and the, the training that they're doing and, and building that together, ubiquitous. So, so something that's everywhere, that's on your personal device, that you can access at a terminal, that's part of everything that you do. And on top of that, I, I see clear focus here on the application of knowledge. So a lot of the traditional e-learning that we were doing and making years ago um, is about knowledge transfer. It's about sort of telling people what they need to know. But sadly, we've seen in, in, in some cases and in closed spaces is one example where I think people do know the fundamentals, but the behavior still goes, um, you know, uh, elsewhere. And, and, and unfortunately, these, these incidents continue. And, um, and so it's also about finding ways to test the application of that knowledge. Can people take the theory and actually put it in practice under pressure? And I'll give you some examples of how we're looking at that. Um, and behavior as well being a key focus. So OKIMF um, and Intertanko paper on the, the behavioral competencies thing is really starting to get, uh, to, to get into that big time. But this is, again, a really key factor. So we have to look at how we bring behavior in. It, it must be considered alongside everything else. And the last one is uh, engagement and adoption. This is a big, big focus for us now, as you'll see uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking through, but like really sort of getting people to sort of to get involved with the material and to sort of that self-directed learning and all those sorts of things, really getting the uptake. 
um, is, is something that we need to focus on and use every, every, uh, every trick that we can. And then on that basis, new types of content that are emerging that, we, uh, that we're certainly working with are designed to sort of, you know, tap into some of these things. A really obvious one in uh, the time poor considerations that we're working in is micro learning. So this is kind of, uh, I'm sure you, you're aware, bite-sized learning, where we're talking about a single learning uh, objective maybe, uh, or it could be alternatively a, a summary, refresher summary, of a group of learning objectives. So you might have acquired the knowledge previously, but then you're sort of rerunning it in short form just to kind of uh, help you remember the key points. So it could be a real sort of aid to, uh, aid to retention in that regard. Um, but for me, there's another sort of exciting thing about micro learning, which is um, the idea, you know, I started worrying when we started working with it, that like, if you've got to go down and log in, and then do a very short piece of training, you kind of might spend more time sort of getting set up and getting ready uh, than, than actually doing the learning yourself. Um, but if you think about this as something that's on the move, that, that that's multi-device driven, then we get into that point of making, being able to sort of snatch those little moments that somebody's kind of got, little pockets of time where they can very quickly access a piece of uh, learning. And maybe even uh, if it's safe to do so, uh, or to be intrinsically safe and all those things, but could we actually sort of take some of these uh, micro learning aids into, uh, for example, a toolbox talk so that we can actually just get those key points there before doing a, a major job or something. So micro learning, uh, and, and I'll come back to something which again sort of really supports the breaking down of learning into smaller chunks uh, a bit later. The other one is a big passion of mine, and uh, in fact, uh, the last time I gave a pre presentation in India was at a Global Met in, in Mumbai um, quite some years ago now, but I was really talking about games in those days and really pushing the, the merits of them as a, as, as a learning tool. And I think I'm really glad to see that there's been some real advances made in, in, that, uh, in, the, in the last uh, few years. Um, and this really, I think the debate is kind of over now, uh, that play is something that we can really harness to to engage uh, the, the new generation. And it's not about competing. You know, the, people often think that that's the message that we're saying, oh, they'd rather be playing Grand Theft Auto, but we're going to give them this learning game that we've produced. You know, the budgets don't come anywhere close. We're not going to be able to compete with that. But what we can do is we can use those mechanics to really sort of engage people and make them sort of um, look at the subject perhaps in a slightly different way. I'll give you an example of something that we're working on. Um, and uh, and it's a really simple little familiarization. Um, and this is not an anima, or this is a recording, but it's not an animation. This is actually uh, somebody sort of controlling this. And you can zoom in and out through the shell of the lifeboat there. And we're just familiarizing ourselves with the scene. And then they get set a little task to find various uh, things within the lifeboat itself. So you could do this in a video where you, where you showed them and walked them along through the lifeboat and showed them where all the equipment was. Um, but this is just a more fun way of doing it with time pressure, with these little bonus questions that they can kind of get a score and all those sorts of things. So still finding, you know, are there more interesting ways that we can take some of these, uh, um, some, some of these different uh, learning objectives that we have and extrapolate them and play with them and kind of, you know, get, make it sort of, uh, make them, make the learner look at it from perhaps from a slightly different angle. Now, another big part of that is, um, is stories. And stories are kind of something that I really have always been drawn to. And, um, and I, I think are really, key to unlocking some of the interest in the learning that we're trying to put across. And you can see the picture there with everybody around the campfire. That, that scene is as old as history in every nation uh, on the earth, where we get together, pick human beings around a campfire, and would tell stories to one another. And that's part of that oral tradition that, um, that later led to, you know, to stories being written down and so on. And then, of course, this image will resonate with many of you, which is just um, from your own memory of having stories read to you as a child or, or indeed of being lucky enough to read some to your own children. And these are 
this is something we do to settle us, to give us comfort, to give us warmth. It's something that we have really positive association with. And of course, when we go off to sleep and our brain starts processing all the crazy things that happened in the course of the day, we kind of form it into a story. Normally it's a bit of nonsense story. Um, and it doesn't really make much sense when you kind of think it through the next day, but you'll all remember waking up and, and that feeling of having sort of had this story playing in your mind. Um, and of course, you know, stories then have sort of con continued to sort of shape uh, our uh, our understanding of the world. So if we think about the, the biggest selling book of all time, which is the Bible, um, it's a religious text, of course, but it's a collection of stories and parables by which we kind of find out or, or it communicates to the followers of that religion how they should interpret and how they should live their lives through through stories. And the Quran is the same with the, the Hadith and all major religions have some element of this where they use stories to explain uh, the philosophy. And so consequently, stories are really hardwired into who we are as a species and how we, uh, how we interpret information. And consequently, they're extremely powerful to use in, in learning. And um, this uh, still hears from uh, the bullying and harassment video that, that uh, we made at, at Videotel and um, with the um, ITF and, and others. And, and this is a tried and tested means that we've used for a number of years to explore different themes and different scenarios and also to sort of reconstruct, dramatic reconstruction of incidents so we can examine case studies and we can show how to do something or how not to do um, something. So there's nothing new about that. We've always been doing that and I'm sure we'll collectively carry on uh, doing that. But there's also much to gain from making stories interactive. And any of you of a certain age, I know these were around when I was a kid, the Choose Your Own Adventure book. And this is a really simple idea you would read the book and at certain points in the story you'd be given a choice of how you wanted the narrative to develop so it would say if you want to go through the the green door turn to page 34 if you want to leave and go down and explore the cave turn to page 86 and uh, and so you could sort of you'd have these jump points all the way through the story and you would basically end up with very different outcomes depending on on how you uh, uh, on the on the choices that you that you made, and the same thing was kind of uh, last year. If you've got Netflix, you will have seen this rebooted for the next generation, which was a a video film, and you could basically uh, you'd watch through the story of the film, and then at certain points with your remote control, you would choose what outcome you wanted to take, and um, and this clearly has huge sort of potential for training in the, the way that we do it and for us to be able to work through uh, sort of play through scenarios so this is kind of interactive pathway learning so you can assess all the, the information available to you take the prior knowledge that you've gained about a subject and then test really your decision making abilities um, so the example there that you see is from an incident investigation program where you're interviewing a witness. And you've got to choose the right questions to elicit the right response uh, from, from the interviewee. And this is what that would look like in the background. So each of those circles is a node that represents different decision points and different, um, uh, different outcomes. You can see it's quite complicated, but there's no real limit other than the production capabilities. Uh, of being able to kind of you know design all of those different uh, points to be able to kind of build out quite complex stories or this one which is a much simpler um, structure was a reconstruction we did of an incident uh, a very tragic incident on a bolt carrier that actually enables you to sort of replay the uh, the incident and the various points at which bad decisions were made and actually sort of put that decision across to the learner. So we asked the learner which way they wanted to go effectively or which is the right approach to take. And rather than let them go off on this big spiraling thing, we just tell them uh, whether that was the right or the wrong decision. So a very simple pathway in this case because we wanted to keep it absolutely guided to an incident. But that one was kind of very simple with illustrations. This next example is more like the Bandersnatch movie um, where we actually take a first aider uh, responder 
uh, scenario and we're playing the person uh, the the learner has to play uh, through the uh, the character if you like of the of the first data and make those decisions about who to treat first what to do procedurally so i'm going to try i'm not sure how successful this will be and hopefully it won't be really loud it might be really loud so anyway i'm gonna play a video Four people have been injured in an explosion. You are the first on scene. You must make decisions for the first aider to ensure everyone survives. If you make a mistake, you'll be sent back to the last checkpoint to try again. You will be scored on the accuracy of your decisions and the time it takes you to make them. So hope, hopefully you could hear that. Uh, that was basically the setup for this when you first start start the uh, the learning sort of I'm going to call it a learning game um, or playthrough scenario. And and what actually uh, that was just saying was that you know you're going to get information, then you're going to get decision points like you can see here where you've got to choose between raising the alarm or checking for danger. And this is a screen from it uh, which perhaps kind of puts it in sharper focus about the sorts of decisions that you have to make. Um, so you've got here, you've got different sort of information about the, 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 uh, the casualties that you have there and you have to decide which of them you're going to, uh, to treat first and, and so on. And, uh, and the other thing to note on that is that you're being scored on the decisions that you make, um, but also being uh, against the clock. So putting on that time pressure, when we start to talk about how we, we want to see how human beings behave, becomes very, very important because, of course, we might make one decision with all the luxury and time to you know, ponder and consider what the right thing to do is compared to being thrust into a situation where you've got to make good decisions fast. And uh, so you can see that this is sort of powerful approach to the narrative to put the person in control. They play the part of that first aider there and they have to think and make the decisions for her as to what they think she, she should do and then watch that unfold. And of course, if you make a mistake here, like a simulator, you know, you're learning from your mistakes in a positive way. And we can take that a little bit further by thinking about, uh, I mentioned a bit about games earlier, but think about the role playing game. I mean, the, that's a genre of game in which you sort of are looking through the eyes of the character. And this is really, really powerful because it gives you a, an even better sort of angle on uh, on feeling that sort of empathy and feeling like you're in that space and that preparation for when you find out you're in a real space. So, th so when you're talking about a role playing game, we're immersing that person in the story and they're not just getting to make choices at set points. Um, they're playing a part and they're controlling the outcome in, in real time. Here's an example from a, a collision avoidance um, game that we've built. So you see you get the standing orders at the beginning, which is kind of the setup of giving you the background information, get the information on the, your, your vessel. But then you're sort of controlling the action there. You're looking around, you're choosing where to go, what uh, instruments to, uh, to work with. When to sort of look out of the window, take bearings that way, and then when to... Um, use uh, instrumentation like the radar and you can see that that's really sort of like uh, as far as engagement's concerned this is sort of you know uh, really sort of a, a key way of being able to do that and of course that that experience that we we showed you there as a mobile game is also as a virtual reality piece and virtual reality is something you know i, I could talk about for hours um I think it's it's taken a bit of a hit in terms of uh, its momentum in, in this year because, of course, in uh, it dependency of it being in physical locations typically, and so consequently, COVID has has been very disrupted to the VR thing. Also, people not wanting to share um, the wearables and all that sort of stuff, you know, uh, or because of uh, because of COVID. So it's taken the wind out of its sails. But I think what we've seen with the history of VR 
is it sort of come in waves and then it sort of maybe it's had a bit of a setback and then it comes back a, a, a stronger. And the thing is that it's, it's, there are so many things that are so compelling about it as a use case that I really don't see a way that this isn't going to just grow and grow and grow in terms of adoption. Um, and the main reason that I say that is really about um, the, the, uh, its ability to, to help with the retention of information and the comprehension of what's going on. So when you're talking about complex procedures, being able to sort of orientate yourself in the space to be able to get an appreciation really of how everything knits together um, is nothing really like it. And the way that the brain uh, interprets experiences that we have over reading about in, uh, an experience that's something that VR taps into. It taps into you, your brain thinks you're doing it. If it's, if it's uh, to put it mild, mildly, it thinks it's actually there, even though your conscious mind may know that it's not. Um, and so consequently, it, it goes into your memory in the same way that when you visit a place, it goes into your memory and you can call it back. So I think this is something that, that is going to make a, a dramatic impact. And what we'll see is, and what we're already seeing really, is that the, the better and better it gets, the closer it starts to come into simulation. So there's, I know ARI on next, you know, I'm sure they'll agree with me that that's why they're looking at things like virtual reality because they can see uh, where it's blended. And then the other thing to think about as well as we were talking um, uh, is a, a, about sort of, things like assessment and being able to remote in. Um, in fact, I've, I've, I've got a slide coming up about this, but like the idea of remote proctoring, what's really exciting about um, virtual reality is you could potentially dial in to someone on the other side of the world and see them performing an operation um, and see, you know, make some sort of assessment of how that's going. So, um, so I think, you know, that that is a and the other thing as well is in terms of we talked about engagement concentration those sorts of things nothing is so 100 percent absorbing as vr because it just takes over all of your sort of sensory information so um so yeah i think that that's uh, that can't be overlooked as a major sort of aid another thing is um rolling your own i've called this one um this is uh something that i think I talked about the pace of change in the industry and the pace of sort of best practice and things like that, the need to be able to orientate people very, very quickly. So I think that um, th there's something we've, we've produced, uh, which we call rapid e-learning, which is wired into the platform that allows you to very quickly pull together some assets you've developed, something like a PowerPoint, PDFs, a video file, put that together with a small assessment and pump that out to specific people in your organization um, to uh, to be able to then assess and see how quickly they can uh, perform that. So it's sort of it's, it's a way of rapidly responding. But I think as well, it's also got a really good uh, ability for to people to sort of add a personalised message. It doesn't, you know, for me, uh, most of what training training that goes on within organisations, you know, it makes sense to pool efforts and to and to use something generic. But being able to to wrap something personal around it that sits alongside that and maybe explains the context also has a lot of value in terms of being able to um, being able to sort of uh, engage with your audience because they can know specifically why this is going to benefit them. Virtual classroom. Now, nothing has kind of uh, gained more momentum in the last sort of six months than this, because this was the um, this was the thing that obviously everybody turned to to be able to um, to deal with the disruption of COVID and not being able to get people into centers, centers and so on. Um, and and so I think that uh, I'm sure this has already come up today, or it will come up later. If not, that this is not something that sort of once people once the rabbit is out of the hat, people are going to going to go back to. Um, but I do think that this is something that we need to think about a little bit more more uh, than we perhaps have been. And I say that because we did something in 2013, which we called Video Tel Academy, um, which um, which I sort of was my kind of baby. And it was to 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 make it happen, and it and it and it basically um, I had to kind of go and source all the software and all that, and work with the tutors and everything to be able to deliver courses online for for um, for Bimco, but also VideoTel as well at the same time. And we learned an enormous amount uh, from doing that. 
and one of the things that I learned on that, and and I know that Captain Shukat is uh, uh, a real aficionado with this. It's not easy to teach online. It's not you know you don't want to do just take what you were doing and and then plonk it sort of you know within a virtual classroom. And so I see that there will be a much bigger sort of focus on building synchronous and asynchronous models that will really sort of maximize impacts and efficiencies. And and the reason I say that is because it doesn't make sense if it's a passive lecture, it's much better to deliver that um, through material that people can access in their own time. It makes it much more scalable um, and, and as I say, much more flexible. You don't need to sort of gather everybody together in real time. And that's an asynchronous kind of model. But then of course, synchronous side of it works very, very well when you want that interaction and engagement and you want people to be able to ask questions and so on. And I liken that to when I was lecturing, we, we sort of had a system of lectures and tutorials and lectures were largely passive um, and, and sort of about a broadcasting of information, whereas the tutorials were smaller groups where people could really sort of get together and exchange ideas and sort of, you know, to check some of that stuff through. So I think there's, there's got to be a, a, a maturity in the use of the virtual classroom. Um, and we also think as well that the, uh, there's a lot of fragmentation because, of course, you can use things like Zoom and you can use things like, you know, um, like Microsoft Teams. The video conferencing bit isn't the difficult bit. Most people can, can organize that. But what we see is big value in integrating it into our platform, which is something we're betering at the moment. Um, because people are already sort of in that space, it allows for that, you know, all the user profiles, everything is in there. All the activities that they do of an asynchronous nature, the e-learning they access and everything, and it, you can then see that pattern all as one thing, all as one pathway. So I think that's really where the, the future of virtual classroom uh, lies, is in sort of bringing that whole piece together within the context of, of everything that's going on. Another big focus, I think, to meet the sort of challenges that we've talked about is moving to a much more performance orientated culture. So we, we have a um, uh, we, we have a line which we, we say, you know, performance beyond compliance. The compliance really all really sort of like, I think, when we look at what's required and what we, where we need to go, it's, it's not about that story anymore. It's a story about performance, about people uh, working at optimum levels about people kind of being able to really sort of transform their organization. And for me, the biggest sort of, um, the biggest sort of change that, that, that could be made is, is through competency management. Now, um, that's nothing new to the industry, but the adoption of a sort of digital uh, integrated um, competency management system is still uh, very, very nascent. You know, there's not that many people doing it. And the ones that we've worked with, we've we've seen some amazing sort of you know uh, transformations in terms of in terms of what they've learned as organisations from going down that road. And of course, the thing about it is that it's um, it's all about for me a sort of a, aside from reaching the sort of standards that are expected from TMSA and things like that. All of that, of course, is really important. But it's also about HR maturity because what it's giving you is a very clear career plan, a designed pathway of what's expected from uh, from skills and behavior and knowledge uh, at different ranks. And consequently, it's very transparently clear to people that they can see that the activities they're being requested to do are leading them on a pathway of career progression, which I think is really, really important. The other thing is that pulling it into a good digital system also means that you you you're sort of people have to care about what they're doing because they're ultimately accountable and there's a trail that you can see there of who signed off whom for which task for which uh, competence and consequently everybody gets very very focused on um, on that sort of quality on the quality of those uh, those training and assessment opportunities that live within it and of course behavior is coming to the fore through uh, things like behavioral competencies, the or BCAB as it's called, um, you know, OCINF and uh, Intertanko um, guidance that was published there. And you're starting to see that then they're able to marry up those technical competencies with behavioral ones as well. And of course we know those two things really uh, knit together. And, and it starts to really mean that there's a really solid connection 
between the learning that people do in th through e-learning and things like that and the real world task that they're able to then do. Now, I'm very excited to work on this um, at the moment because I think that adaptive learning is something that works really nicely uh, hand in hand. So where we're talking about competency, we're talking about designed pathways, very structured pathways, maybe based around sort of rank. Um, uh, when we talk about adaptive learning, we're talking about dynamically created learner pathways. So we're talking about the ability to pull together um, you know, through assessments and things like that, identify weaknesses and that generate a pathway for the learner, which is personal to them. And that's something that I think, as I say, working hand in hand there, we start to really maximize time because what you're doing is you're saying, if it's adaptive, not everybody needs to go through everything. Maybe certain people have achieved a certain amount of knowledge already and they don't need to repeat and so on. So more efficient uh, way of operating. And both those things need to live, as I talked about before, in the in the LMS. Um, but the LMS has too often in the past been considered as just a sort of a learning locker, you know, a place where all the good learning that they, they need uh, lives. And so the focus has been all about the quality of the content, not so much how it's accessed. But I think that if we think about the learning management system as not only managing the learning, but also the, the learner experience, um, then what we um, then what we need to do is focus much, much more carefully on it as something that can be transformative to, uh, to um, the learner. And uh, so it's, it's, you can see sort of some, this is a, a, an early uh, version of a platform that we're releasing in the new year, which is our new uh, learning platform. And you'll see there, this is really where you're setting the context, you're clarifying the tasks, you're sort of uh, putting together things like that, that can motivate the learner so they can see sort of how they're, trajectory is going, they can present the goals that they need to meet and see how far they are along that pathway. And, um, and all of that really requires something called UX design, user experience design. This is really where uh, we start to think about, not just about sort of functionally the system working and delivering sort of what the, the person needs it to do on a functional level. User experience design is really about sort of going that higher level and thinking about how we want them to respond, how we want them to feel about their experience and have it sort of be a almost like effortless, subconscious, pleasing experience that they want to do and therefore the adoption of the learning and all the other the really important stuff that we've got to uh, work with them is that much easier. And it's particularly important when we talk about learning UX because it can help us to, to, to minimize the cognitive load and cognitive load is the amount of uh, working memory that a person is using in uh, in the in the task that they're that they're performing. So if we if we start to load that up because they're thinking about well how does how does navigation work? What what am I supposed to do next? All of those things, all of that cognitive load that we increase there is brain power that's not being used and concentrated on what we want them to be doing, which is the learning task, the learning activity, and that's why. Um, we think it's such an important area of focus and something worth investing in. So really the learning management system is key uh, to, to that process. Is it working? So that's the other thing about UX. If you're kind of uh, designing the experience for the user, they really need to get that feedback. And you do that through uh, in the development process, obviously you're, you're working through it with personas and user stories and things like that to sort of make your assumptions or researched assumptions around the way to do it. But nothing's gonna beat actually sort of engaging um, with the, the audience themselves. And there are lots of different ways you can do this. You can, I'm sure you already do use uh, things like SurveyMonkey and everything. But we've gone for uh, opting to bring that into the learning uh, platform itself and actually enable you to run surveys through exactly, so they, they come in at the exact point that the, that the learner is accessing that learning and that they're uh, able to sort of then feedback through all that same mechanism so you can run reports on, on what they were learning and see that data sort of side by side. So being able to kind of, uh, get this feedback though is the crucial thing, to be able to have um, the voice of the seafarer there when you're designing these experiences and to change what you're doing, uh, refine what you're doing and do more of what works essentially. 
Another big barrier um, is about delivery. And I know it's a constant source of frustration to, to everybody to be able to, um, to be able to do, uh, to be able to sort of get the learning that's needed out at, at the right time. And this is one of the crucial things that we're, um, we're focused on at the moment is how can we speed that up so that content is actually being distributed over the top through the through satellite broadband and not on USB sticks, but have to be gotten around all over the world. So I think this is a big, this is something that we're hoping that the acceleration in adoption of technology is going to lead to more opportunities for us to utilize that technology to get content where it needs to be faster. And then this, uh, and it, oh, I've just realized I've gone over time. How unlike me. Uh, Ocean Insights then. So this is really just kind of the way that we're looking at bringing together uh, crew training and vessel performance and putting those together. Because when we look at uh, having acquired technology brands such as uh, Terra Marine, we have stuff in there about plan maintenance. So we can see, for example, on uh, the longevity of parts and things like that. If we can start to marry that with training data, then we can start to look at how we, uh, how training and uh, assessment might sort of show us something about the human being in there and what their abilities and capabilities are, and marry that with the performance data of the vessel. And if we can see direct relationships between knowledge and things like sort of keeping uh, keeping a vessel well maintained over there, we start to sort of be able to provide real value in terms of you know linking together. Uh, incident information with performances, if you've got an HSCQ module, that kind of thing. So this, I think, is a really massive opportunity. So I'm going to wrap things up now and just summarize for you. I think uh, we talked about the challenges up front. Um, we need new approaches, techniques, and tools to be able to tackle this uh, error. We need the ubiquitous platform, so we need them to follow the learner and be there at the point of need. New content types uh, that can engage the imagination. And we need to use things like stories and emotional techniques and the UX whole side of things to be able to um, to really get people kind of engaged in what they're doing. Um, yeah, and uh, and to reach those performance levels, let's use the data and let's uh, let's kind of um, yeah use every tool that we can really to try and prepare our people and to build the talent that we need to meet the challenges. Thank you very much. Wow. <clears throat> well, I couldn't move for my seat, actually. <laughs> oh, because uh, no, I can't hear it. <laughs> very, very solid. Uh, a lot of things. In fact, a uh, huge amount of uh, things. Uh, it's not just only a presentation. I mean, in each slide you had, I felt that there have been quite a number of months and probably years gone into, gone into the whole setup. Well, I'm, I'm always torn, you know, because you could take sort of four things and talk about them uh, in, you know, for half an hour each one. I mean, any of those subjects, you know, I've done presentations that are longer, but I think um, everything connects with everything else now. And, and so it's sort of you have to look at everything in the, uh, in the round, I think. Well, if you just can stop sharing, or if you want to share something else, or if you can just stop sharing, we can have a chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm done with the sharing, yeah. So I, I was, well, um, like you know, I've been doing a lot of training myself over the years, but certain things, and I, I feel it's, it's the right opportunity to to ask you as as maritime service providers and leaders on, in technology. So, so Ocean Technology has been the maritime leader for many years in 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 building a value for for customers and seafarers. Are you? Uh, are you investing in new technologies suiting the market 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 requirements now? Well, yeah, we're investing yeah huge amounts of money um, and uh, you know in in lots of different um, directions really. But I think that the UX thing is probably the most unifying thing that we you know we when we got together we put these brands together. You know, old enemies, you know, in some cases, and uh, and sort of said, well, what, you know, what should, what could we do? We we could, you know, there were all sorts of things, and UX emerged very, very early on as something that we felt that we'd always wanted to do more with, um, and it's it it's you know it, it's difficult for people perhaps because they might look at that and just think, well, that's just the candy, that's the easy bit, you can make it look nice. 
but it's really just kind of like it's almost like the skill there is almost being the uh, the hit the unseen art you know it's it's people if people don't notice it's there that's where the that's where the talent comes in because i think i think what we you know because what you don't want it to do is to be a barrier to to the learning it should be something that's sitting there and uh, and in the past so ux is an area um and then there's you know as i mentioned there the sort of the gamification side of it that's a, it's it's a very um it's a very expensive thing to do you know and and there's no you know games cost more than movies you know professional commercial games yes, yes. um but again it's about sort of working out where you where you're spending that money to get the biggest bang for your buck you know and and to sort of um so so these are these are sort of areas but then you know there's also a huge amount of work that goes in and that we have, we're putting into the backbone that underpins all this stuff so the things that people will never see to just make it kind of run better be more you know less friction um so yeah you know i mean it, it's on a lot of fronts uh, yeah i can uh, understand when you say that people won't be able to see it that lots lots and lots of uh, final things that you got to do especially when you're integrating uh, technologies with with the end product and and you rightly said uh, Cal, uh Ral, you rightly said when talk about day and when that brings me to my next question i had really written it down we've been talking to a lot of pro last four and a half uh, months that we've been working on this event and we've met a lot of uh, service providers for games they they're not related to maritime industry in any way but they say that they can bring in the technology which we can infuse in our maritime training right now do you yeah. think uh, with with the gamification there are two things here ral which i want to ask you one is why is the necessity of gaming is it because the attitudes are changing in order to uh, the, in order to suffice to the present generation because they are more into games or is it the right way to do training or the um, new way to do training yeah I, I, for me i i think the 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 latter you know I, I i don't think that there's any one i'm a really strong believer as in blended learning first and foremost i mean i i i would never say that everything should be put into vr or everything should go into you know video or anything but it's a fact of life that the more you know the more the more engaged we are the better the learning is and you could look at you know everybody that's been in a simulator and has sort of played around in there will know that that that's a much more visceral and real way of doing it. so the things that are more visual audio you know things that sort of have more agency where we're being asked to do more rather than sit back and listen more um that that is sort of really where i'm coming from from the games perspective it's more like what do we want to achieve we want to achieve something where people are really being asked to kind of apply their knowledge to be able to kind of actually do things enact things uh, and then how can we get there well games technology guess what that gives us a lot of those things to be to be able to do that so i think and it's also about i think one of the things that's kind of key is understanding that thing about how a child learns a child learns by picking stuff up and playing with it and putting you know and bashing things you know that, that's how they find out that some things break and some things don't and all, you know so it's it's how we're hardwired to be able to uh, acquire and make sense of the world and if we can use that technology and use that sort of fundamental human being approach to knowledge building and not fight against it actually use it then for me you you're sort of um you know you're you're getting somewhere but it is an it is a it is a point that's worth acknowledging that we are now in a battle all of us all the time with things that are competing for our uh, attention and you know that's why i think if people are used to you know if they're on their app having a fantastic experience because this app was spent a 30 million dollar app that does you know to, they then got to jump into their learning app it's got to be as good in terms of the intuition in terms of it feeling personal to them in terms of the way it responds to them and so so you know it, you there is all there is a a part of it which is you've got to spend x amount on that just to turn up you know just to kind of meet the base level um yes yes, yes. Yeah. Ral, one more thing I, I i find very intriguing is the the, the setup of your, of your of your organization right now with coex and marlins and, and videotel and of course seagull so it's very interesting because is this a conscious decision to acquire companies which blend well with the strategy uh, in the sense that you take the feed of maybe training needs analysis through seagull and then make your own videos depending on what 
uh, I don't know how it works, but I'm sure these these have to be lending uh, their uh, research into each other's uh, needs, and uh, then you're going to take the feeds from Seagull and make another training for, and and then how does it well, work? Well, I mean, essentially, what we've done is we've kind of gone for the philosophy of us being one one team, uh, and so there's one executive team which I'm uh, part of. Which, which uh, is working across all of the brands and across all of the, the customers that have various touch points with that brand. And, and some customers have attachments to multiple brands. Um, so it's really been a case of us working through uh, that as one team and working out how best to solve problems. That's really where the, the orientation has, has come from because we think that essentially our success as a business is gonna come from solving more of our customers' problems and, and uh, uh, and so, so we've been looking at it very much on that basis. But of course, different brands have come in at different times, and so some are more more on that integration journey uh, than others. So of course, Seagull and Videotel was the was the big uh, acquisition last year. So we're much further along the road of having having allied what we're doing together um, than perhaps you know some of the other the brands that were acquired in the course of this year. But ha our philosophy is that that we are working as, as one team um, to solve you know, the customer's problem and uh, and the rest of it is really, uh, from the brand point of view, it, it is more about what we can bring from the heritage of those brands that's really kind of the bit that really adds the value. Wow. Making sure we nurture that. Yes. So we, we, are, I, we, we are already uh, in the time slot now, but I think one quick question, and this is a personal question which I, I've been wanting to ask and that is whenever we talk about maritime training and skill building it's always it's always about either navigation or sh or running a ship mostly it's it's a subconscious bias about either navigation training or the technical stuff regarding bridge and uh, engine room uh, maritime in maritime training is 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 much more than just training seafarers it's about also i was going to like i said last so many months i've been interacting with a lot of service providers and we we somebody presented to us on how robotics and remote robotics have affected the 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 repairs of main engine now now people just have their headsets on on the ship and they are being guided by shore technicians and they just see exactly what they see on the panels and and they they they, they do just do the repairs and that even the repairs are i think over internet are kind of uh, digitally monitored so are you also into that or is this uh, this is a different way of training but this is this is all about maritime training right it's a part of maritime training as well yeah i mean i think there's always there's always a bias towards um uh i think the the sort of navigational side because when problems happen uh, in in on the navigational side they're very very it's very kind of clearly linked or they very quickly typically link to to human behavior and they're very sort of high profile it's about typically the investigation goes you know this is what the this this incident came down to one person making this bad decision and how are we going to stop people making that decision again um the engine room tends to be a little bit more um a little, little bit uh, less focused because it could be just as attributable to human uh, factors yeah. But it doesn't show up as a human factor. It shows up as a part that that, that failed, you know. And um, but it could it could well be, you know. So that's the bias, I think. And we have tried to uh, done various things over the years to try and sort of repoint that. And I, I but I think that that will come into sharper focus, you know, as 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 ships become more technical spaces. I, I would fully expect to see that. To your other point around, um, which is less about learning and more about sort of remote support. Yes, um, yes. Through sort of, you know, an augmented reality. We didn't talk about that really, but like augmented reality, the ability for you to be able to sort of see an overlay to support a maintenance task or, or whatever, or indeed somebody being able to sort of prop to you from a, from a distance and actually see how you're sort of doing it and performing stuff. I think all of that is, is I would say, almost inevitable. I would say uh, we were talking about that five or six years ago when Videotel was part of KVH, um, and we were very excited about how to sort of use that connectivity. You know, um, one of the reasons why it's, it's I think, not happened um, it, yet is that when you actually start looking at a digital twin of a, of a vessel, it's, 
the the volume of things that there are to sort of consider that you would have to cover is so enormous and it's so different on uh, you know there's very little opportunity for uh, for it to be sort of you know uh, uh, scaled up and i and i and i think people would be reluctant to say well i'm going to use i'm going to do my you know my my ballast water system system like this but then everything else is not being done that way so i think i think that will come because it's a kind of an obvious no brainer but at the same time i i don't think it's going to be a near term thing i still see it as being a ways off yet but i could be wrong yeah 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 absolutely i agree with you on that and uh, another thing which i wanted to ask you before we call it today and uh, uh, we've heard of ar mr and vr and everybody talks about AR, VR, and one thing new in the market which I heard over the last two months, three months is is XR, hmm. and it's it's a new kind of uh, VR technology or something. Any any idea? Any any kind of? I because I personally have no idea on XR, but I've been hearing this yeah. quite a lot from technology service providers. Yeah, I think it's just a, I think it's just the term that people kind of feel is more. Uh, what's the word more more sort of you know more brings the whole piece together because i think there are there are sort of very when you look at um i used to do a presentation on this where you look at sort of when you talk about vr and you talk about um uh, uh, ar they they they're sort of they can be described in very different terms but but really when it comes to sort of talking about xr you're sort of saying well this is a kind of a false wall and between them and actually something that sort of enco- encompasses the whole the whole thing so it's the same you know it, it's not like a new thing that's come along that's sort of okay, you know, okay, it, okay it's more it's more sort of um because for example it would bring in some of the wearables and some of the you know the the things that extend the vr experience so beyond sort of virtuality being something that's about what you're seeing it could be that there are various other wearables and parts to it that are sort of creating that experience right. So Ral, I think we've come to the end of our session. I mean, thank you very much for the engagement you bring in, and it's, it's really actually it's uh, it's it's really great to hear uh, things from the experts who are going to, you know, define uh, what the future of work and future of training uh, are going to be. And and uh, ocean technologies, like I've told you before, and we were really happy to have you the, here at the FSM because you bring a huge amount of value with the kind of company, with the kind of group that you are, with 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 pertaining to skill development as well as pertaining to working and research and investing in uh, few knowledge about future skills and investing on the future i think uh, people and maritime industry is going to really really benefit from what you're going to offer them so well, I, hope our, so. Yeah. I hope to be worthy of that you know that that wonderful uh, description but that's exactly how we we see it so we're very grateful to to be here yeah, absolutely. And to get you already, to you already are well, you already are we, uh, one last time, I would like to thank you for your engagement and thanks for supporting the Future Skills uh, Maritime FSM 2020. And we've got a very good viewership over Facebook for all of us, all of you people who've been connected to us whole day today. Some of you have been logged in from the morning as well and they've not left the platform. Thank you so much for your engagement. And I know this is a huge learning for all of us, even mine too, as I sit through the deliberations of all the experts and all the solvers from the industry. So. It is Naval Connection to saying goodbye. Please, please visit the Ocean Technology Group stall. And we've got a whole, whole day tomorrow. We'll be driving people to the stall. And then well, uh, we've got a video also lined up in the stall as well. And uh, maybe we can have a session for the seafarers to know about what lies ahead, what kind of things that the really great companies in the world are working and investing on, which will decide on how we work in the future. So. Uh, from me, Captain Shaukat Mukherjee, from the Naval Connection, from the Future Skills Maritime, this is our fourth session today. And we have one more very interesting session coming up. Another huge t- technology group, the Applied Research International, ARI, big, big name in maritime training, started off in India and now going really global into many, many countries coming up. Wait with us, watch with us, and we'll be there with you. So, Ral, we'll wait at the backstage now. If it's okay with you, then we want to end this session with, a, again, a very big thank you to Ocean Technology Group and special mention to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Manish Gupta also. Right. Uh, Manish Singh, sorry. Manish Singh also. Yeah, yeah Manish says hi. Manish says hi. Okay. Thank you so much, Ral. And uh, now can we, uh, can we end this session, please? Go on to the next one.